This is a big lecture hall, and all of you are quite scattered around, but I'm glad to have a mic. That makes a huge difference. So it's a real pleasure to be here. I always enjoy tremendously coming to speak at Evergreen. I love Evergreen students. I love Evergreen faculty. I love the idea of Evergreen. So hopefully you'll enjoy this lecture. So it's based on my book, and I'm passing around a copy of the book. Uh, I don't know if it'll make it to the outer reaches up there, but um, I brought a few copies in case anybody is so inspired they want to rush up here with $28 after the lecture. And I've, I've asked uh, Evergreen to order it for the library. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether that's happened or not, but you can ask your professors to insist on it. The lecture will be uh, expanding on the book as well as talking about the content of the book. I, I cover about 80 artists in the book, and it was published uh, in uh, the d December of 2011, so it's a, it's a fairly new, uh, fresh book, but I, everything is happening so fast, and I don't like to sit still, so I'm including material uh, that's not in the book as well, particularly about Occupy. So I'll go ahead and start. There are two quotes here. One is the, a critic from the 1930s. My previous book, Art and Politics in the 1930s, was, that's when I started looking at the intersection of art and politics because it was really big in the 30s with the Communist Party and artists were very much involved with expressing social issues. And Anita Brenner was a critic who wrote about mainly the Mexican muralists like Diego Rivera, Frida Kahlo's husband, he's now known as. Uh, the issue of whether art should emphasize the realities and tragedies of the world or should soothe and enchant with illusion is still before us. So she wrote that in 1937, and we still have that issue before us in the art world today. And then my second quote is from a recent theorist, a sociologist. The most disputed border of all is the one that separates the field of cultural production and the field of power. This is a really important idea, which I hope to return to at the end of the lecture. So I'm going to start with a few historical artists, because the idea of expressing concern about the state of the world didn't just start yesterday. And there are some extraordinarily important artists, Goya being number one. And this particular image, I think, is ab oh, I should be turning the lights down a little, shouldn't I? So you can see. Let's try this. Is that going to work? There, now you can see it better, much better. OK, uh, Goya uh, working uh, at the beginning, very late 18th, early 19th century, uh, did a series of extraordinary etchings uh, about the abuse of power. And he's best known for the Disasters of War series, which I'll show you one of a little later in the lecture. But this particular uh, work is uh, absolutely timely, absolutely now, from 1797. The sleep of reason produces monsters. And I don't really need to explain it. There's the man sleeping, and there come the monsters. Uh, Goya also did this benchmark painting. The interesting thing about Goya is that he worked for the king of Spain, and yet he was willing to protest the policies of the king of Spain. So this very famous painting, 3rd of May, 1808, the shooting of guerrillas in Spain by mercenaries hired by the Spanish government. It was painted in 1814. This was the period of time when Napoleon invaded Spain in order, by agreement of the government of Spain, he said, come on in, Napoleon, you know, I, I'm happy to have you. Hard to believe, but these governments do these things. And the people of Spain rose up and said no, That's, which is what we're doing today. And they said no. And that was the first guerrilla war. And this is a document, an extremely important painting, which talks about the sacrifice of these brave guerrillas. But most of his disasters of war do not advocate anything positive. They're saying these are the horrors of war, and they don't actually distinguish between which side is more horrible. A, a later 19th century painting also talking about uh, repression of abuse of power by Manet, uh, Emperor Maximilian, who was installed in Mexico as a puppet, uh, was, uh, was killed, was shot by uh, forces uh, for, in that case, a government that opposed uh, the takeover of their country. Another really important uh, artist from the uh, early 20th century worked up until the 1930s, Katie Kulvitz. Uh, she was also a printmaker. This is a work she did fairly early in her career. And notice this big woman here on the left. It's Black Anna. 
And this was a peasant uprising, very early, this is pre-industrial revolution, uh, and the, it's a series of images, really powerful, but you can see she's talking about the force of rising up against oppression, and we don't need to explain what kind of oppression a peasant suffered in the 16th century. They were used as, you know, to haul carts, they were used like animals. You will see this image again in the work of a contemporary artist. And then, of course, also very well known to all of you, Guernica, I think you're probably familiar with this painting. And the subject of the painting uh, is, again, um, uh, an attack on Spain, the bombing of a sacred town, the name of the town, Guernica, uh, aerial bombing. And we think it's the first instance of civilians being bombed from the air. Uh, they were Nazi planes. The Nazis were trying out their planes in the 1930s. This is before World War II. And the government of Spain was colluding, well, not the elected government of Spain, the opposition to the elected government of Spain was asking the Nazis to come in. And they bombed this village, which not only was it not a military target, it was also a sacred village. So Picasso's incredible painting, and notice it has no color, uh, based on cubism, I, I hope maybe you're familiar with cubism, the fracturing of the forms, um, is showing the agony of these people, the, the very famous mother and child with her face right up against that bull which represents fascism, the, the, the dead warrior here, the mother grieving, and in the center you see a figure with a torch, and that, is, that light is, is, a, is a sign of some sort of hope, although in fact this village was entirely obliterated. And just to remind you uh, that art history often edits out politics uh, as a little aside, um, the work by Picasso of Guernica, as well as his massacre in Korea and his very amazing War and Peace mural, are pretty much seen as the low point of his career by mainstream art historians who only like abstract work and pretty work. The, the, the quote at the beginning, the soothe and calm with illusion or narcissism or whatever. But these are actually uh, extraordinarily powerful works. This massacre in Korea was shown in Seattle last year in the big Picasso show. Uh, and here, war, uh, the war part of a war and peace chapel in southern France is actually referencing the use of chemical weapons uh, and very specific. Picasso remained really political from the late 30s until the end of his life. But if you read any book about him, it won't tell you that. OK, so now I'm going to start with the contemporary work. And I thought just to, as a little reminder of the chronology, uh, because things do go by very fast, uh, the first Gulf War, 1991, 1991, that's a long time ago, 20 years, which was the first Bush war, a uh, very short but very devastating. 93, we're focusing mainly here on, um, on the uh, protests of global, uh, uh, global trade. Uh, in 93, you have the beginning of the protests of free trade by farmers in India. In 95, the really well-known uprising by the Zapatistas in Chiapas, Mexico. And how did it become well-known? For two reasons. One, because they used performance. They, were, they used a lot of performance techniques. They were very, very creative expression of resistance to the uh, obliteration of their, of their lifestyle. And also, they had internet technology for the very first time. So this was an extraordinary breakthrough. And then in 99, the anti-World uh, Trade Organization protests in Seattle shut down the meetings, which I'm sure you've all heard about. I'm just going to mention it briefly, uh, still as a prelude to, uh, to the works. But my book does begin at this point. And one of the things I want to emphasize to all of you of this generation is that in 90, now this is a little um, fractured, but it doesn't matter. Um, in 1999, as these world trade protests were going on, and as they changed from celebratory to uh, confrontation with the police, the only way that it could be shown on the internet was with, as I said up here, a webcam taped to a window, which had a cable going across to a, a computer, uh, probably a, a, a dial-up connection, and filmed at 30 second intervals in short spurts. And look where we are today. You know, in the palm of our hand, we can see what's happening in Tahrir Square or in Chicago uh, last weekend. So this was uh, the first time that a, a protest in the US was on the internet. And of course, it amplified the events. So uh, one of the sub-themes of this 
of my book is, is that idea of uh, to what extent are people aware and increasingly educated. This was a, a work, uh, a, a performance person who was honoring that first Zapatista uh, uprising and connecting to it uh, in the anti-World Trade Organization protests in Seattle. And this was the most famous uh, image from that, uh, from that uprising, the Rainforest Action Network, Ruckus Society, various groups that are still very active today uh, created this massive banner, which pretty much explains where we are now as well. I think the World Trade Organization, of course, well, the first idea of creating a, an organization that was supranational, that was, that was bypassing local, um, uh, local regulations. And so I'm going to explain a little bit more about that with this artist's work. Alan Sekula has been addressing the idea of global trade uh, for decades in his work, and you can see this piece 1987 to 1993. It's called Fish Story. And uh, Alan Sekula's work is, uh, his, his work is photography and text. I'm not showing you the texts here, but he shows a series of, of, of photographs, and next to each photograph he has a text. Um, he actually went to uh, Korea, Scotland, Poland, photographing the major port cities around the world and how po po poverty, prosperity, and political powers play out in these ports. There are 900 color photographs in the entire uh, group. So uh, in my book, I quote a couple of the captions. For example, arms for the Iraqis in the front of the boat, arms for the Iranians in the back of the boat. This was during the period of the Iran-Iraq war. The other point that he's making, and you can see it here, is the dehumanization of trade as a result of these global trade uh, practices. It used to be the port cities were alive with people and communities and, 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 and the workers on the boats had health care and decent salaries and they were all connected. Now you have these, uh, these boats that are not connected legally or uh, in any way to the port where they're, where they're anchoring. They have what they call flags of convenience, which means that they, put, they identify themselves with a country that doesn't have any regulations, and they, can, they dock in the port. You see hardly, hardly anyone here. There's just one man. Um, they have these uh, anonymous containers, uh, and, and they have uh, uh, mechanized the, um, the practice of loading and unloading. So the whole port system has become a highly robotic and abstract system that does not have any kind of regulation in terms of health care or union wages or any of those important things uh, in this globalized shipping industry. Now, of course, here on the West Coast, we still have a powerhouse longshoreman union, and uh, we're very proud of what they've been able to do in resistance to global trade in the last few years. So Alan Sakula happened to be in Seattle during the uh, anti-WTO um, protests, and he did a series of works, which he called Five, Five Days That Shook the World. This piece, he did maybe 25 photographs he published in a book with that title, echoing the John Reed book about the Russian Revolution, uh, Ten Days That Shook the World. And the uh, imagery of the uh, photographs by Sakula is not intended to be iconic. He didn't seek, you know, this is the defining image of this event. He sought out just the informal interactions of people. And here you see, this is a reference to um, a particular union that he was familiar with, and then uh, somebody interacting informally. But it captures that sense of people coming together from different parts of our, our, uh, our society, the unions, the ecologists, all different types of people, and that's still happening today. I want to make a point, though, that I do think there is an absolute direct line between these Seattle protests and, and, and what's happening in Occupy. So then we have 911. It's like this full stop. The whole mood of the country changes. And I think this is an amazing piece. Uh, I think it should, it should have been the piece uh, that, that was the uh, honoring of the towers by two artists, uh, Julian LaVerdiere and Paul Miota. And uh, I just learned that they recreate this piece every year on 911. So some of these are recreations. That's the artist's photograph of it, which is very, very different. And then these are, you can see they look a little bit different. But that is just to uh, stop a moment and look at that. But when I say the mood changed, uh, in my book I talk about the idea that memorializing something is very different than protesting something. Now that might seem 
obvious to you. But when you really think about the effect of the 911 attacks in New York and around the country, um, it became a stop moment, a stop moment. And this is just one example which, is, which, is, which I chose for my book, Prayer for the New Ancestors, commemorative, an altar for the warrior spirits of 911. This is uh, Leslie King Hammond, who's a uh, African-American artist uh, in Baltimore, and she collected all the, a, a, a lot of the newspapers' uh, accounts and made an altar in a kind of Santeria tradition based on her own um, perspective. So it's a memorial. But then you have Dred Scott, and Dred Scott made a memorial too, very, very soon after uh, 911, but his memorial is a memorial to Afghan children who were being killed. Already, the war started three weeks after um, 9 -1 and he cut out newspaper articles about children who had been killed by our bombs. And of course, people didn't like that very much. He was called unpatriotic. But Dred Scott is a very provocative artist, and he's used to being called unpatriotic. And then, of course, performance art began right away um, in this amazing piece uh, that, that happened uh, on September 25th which was a week before the war began in Afghanistan in 2001. Uh, and this, this is a group of people that uh, have evolved in various ways, but this approach to public protest is still very much going on uh, right up to the present moment. Okay, so the first part of my book focuses on various types of collective resistance, and I, this is the umbrella series of events uh, for that, uh, the Afghan war, as I mentioned, February 15th, worldwide anti-war protest against the Iraq war. March 19th, the Iraq war begins. 2004, the Abu Ghraib tortures exposed by cell phone technology and posted on the internet. 2008, the financial crisis and recession begins. So that's the uh, background. So uh, <clears throat> during the Iraq war, especially, uh, everybody had come out of shock and were protesting, there were a lot of creative uh, approaches to the, uh, pro to the uh, war protests. This was banners that were hung in the Senate office building, huge banners, uh, which I, I thought was an absolutely brilliant technique. March of the Dead through Washington, D.C., people with masks, and each person represented a specific person who had died in Iraq or a U.S. Uh, person who had died. And uh, most recently, the same group of people, the same collaborative has even uh, addressed uh, <clears throat> Trayvon Martin. And I bought one of these shirts. I meant to wear it today, but I forgot. Um, and it's amazing how you can wear that shirt anywhere, and it applies almost to anything now. Another collective group uh, is the printmaking collective Just Seeds Cooperative, which has done an amazing portfolio about war is trauma. They do many, many different portfolios, and I encourage you to look at their website. Uh, but these are just a couple of examples of their, co they work collectively, they're nationally based, uh, and they have extraordinarily uh, e exciting art uh, addressing extremely important issues. And then locally, how many of you have heard of the Backbone Campaign? Anybody? Nobody, okay. I didn't put in too much because they've been all over the state and in Olympia and everything, so I thought you might not need to hear too much and you can find out about it. But the Backbone Campaign is another collective resistance group and uh, they use what's called tactical media. They have many different approaches to social justice issues, giant puppets, music, song, dance, flash mobs, humor, all sorts of things. And uh, this particular piece, is very recent, obviously. <clears throat> it's from last summer, where it was a protest in front of Paul Allen's house with this giant um, inflated um, rear end. <laughs> but more recently, uh, I, I think even just since last summer, this has been a technique that they've started doing light projections as a form of, of a, a, a protest. And this was, of course, about the uh, the Corporate Personhood Amendment, the Citizens United decision that corporations are people, which is one of the targets now for many groups. And uh, so they projected this onto the Supreme Court. And they, they, on their website, they described doing these light projections in various places. Apparently in North Carolina, they somehow declared 
light projections illegal and arrested them, which is kind of an interesting concept. So Backbone is a really wonderful group, and this is their most recent piece. I thought this was good for you guys, Occupy Graduation, right? Uh, and they made this, uh, they do a lot of street art, a lot of marches, and this, of course, is the student debt ball and chain. Okay, so that's Backbone. And then the Occupy. Uh, have any of you been involved with the Occupy here in Olympia? Do I see any hands? No, okay. It's been big here. Uh, I'm just going to say a few things about it because it's, uh, it's a subject in itself that I'm still working on, but it's obviously a manifestation of creativity uh, in a public place. And uh, the concept of Occupy to not only express the dissatisfaction of the 99%, but also to declare a new society through these, uh, these environments. As long, this is a quote from uh, Diana Taylor, uh, who is a director of a hemispheric institute which studies performance art all over the Americas. As long as human beings can make, a, make room for imagination, they will be artists. And I think that is uh, what the Occupy movement has been about. So as we look at these huge public, this is, this is Spain, this is Egypt, this is Greece, that's me <laughs> talking to the protesters in Egypt. Um, these huge public manifestations, this is Seattle, uh, this is an artist at Zuccotti Park. We see them as a creative expression of a new society. But also many artists came to these uh, occupies, and this was a, a young man who does extraordinary drawings, uh, and uh, here's one of his drawings uh, uh, done at Occupy Wall Street. Uh, he, you can also find him online and buy one of his uh, a reproduction of one of his prints. Uh, so there were poets. I met a wonderful street poet there, uh, drummers, all sorts of creative people in all of these sites. More recently, the Occupy has been intersecting uh, with various specific issues and using really creative imagery in terms of art and politics. So uh, this, was, this was a foreclosure march. This, this is a model of a building that the some of the artists in Occupy created a building in Harlem that was threatened with foreclosure, and these are people from Harlem who are talking about the importance of this building. And then they brought it down to the Museum of Finance down at the bottom of Manhattan, and of course the police did not welcome them. But they were intersecting between the creative group in Occupy and the foreclosure group in Occupy. And for me, this is what uh, is, is happening now. Uh, as I said, this is not in my book. Another uh, sort of intersection of Occupy and the art world, uh, Occupy Museums. <laughs> this was occupying the Dinosaur Gallery at the Museum of Na Natural History in New York City because it was funded by the Koch brothers who were the right-wing funders of the Tea Party and other right-wing causes. Uh, and then Occupy Design. Uh, there, there are all of these different aspects that bring together artists and and uh, various creative expressions. And I just chose four really different uh, types of designs. I'm not going to go into the uh, sources of each one of them. This one is sort of cubist. Uh, but it shows you the coming together of things that previously were separated. Um, and of course, genetically modified food has been bringing out a lot of demonstrators, a lot of, of comments, a lot of protests. and. Uh, one of the aspects of, of, of the Occupy that is very creative are the, are the signs, and this, of course, is, is one of them. Environmental issues like the Keystone Pipeline. Are you familiar with that, folks? I took out my explanatory slides of the Keystone Pipeline because I thought, oh, Evergreen's going to know about that. The Tar Sands Pipeline that they want to put across the country from Canada to Texas was the huge protest last summer. They made this giant pipeline right around the White House. And just to be really current, this was last weekend, again you have this embodiment of creative resistance in the street in, New York, in Chicago, the protests of the Occupy and anti nato people, and it connects us back to those European sources. The Greek left-wing party that was just uh, given many seats in Congress in Greece sent a message of support to the people in Chicago. So the embodiment of protests in these huge creative uh, expressions is, is, is really, really a new thing. 
So let's look now at some specific artists uh, individually, because I don't draw any lines. Some people, there's a new book that just came out by someone named Nato Thompson, and he only talks about living as form. He only talks about things in the street, but I personally think art that hangs on a wall can be really powerful too. And, but we'll start with somebody who was doing a performance piece at Occupy Wall Street in New York. This is an Australian performance artist, and he had this, uh, this great uh, gar garment that he'd made, Fossil Fools, the Global Climate Wake Up Call, uh, There Are No Jobs on a Dead Planet, and then he had flags, he had signs, he had all sorts of stuff all over the place. And the back of his um, garment, drinking water, more precious than gas. So he's referring to a lot of different environmental issues, nuclear, fr gas fracking, um, all different issues. And 350.org, of course, is the group that's uh, protesting. The Beehive Collective, now I said individuals, but what I'm thinking here is the, these are individual artists working together rather than the uh, idea of the collective out in the street. And they do make these amazing prints. And I know you can't see this very well, I should have taken it out, but this is the size of the whole print. It's about, it's about four feet high. Have they been here, by the way? No, you should have them. You should totally have them. They have been here. Yeah, it would be surprise me that they wouldn't have been here because they absolutely belong here. So did you see them? Yeah, weren't they fabulous? Yeah. Um, Plan Columbia, they probably showed this to you. They give their stuff away for free, too, because they, don't, they, don't, want, uh, you know, they don't, don't want to be embedded in capitalism. But this, this is about uh, the uh, oil and drug war in Colombia. And it, it, you can't see this here, but the detail gives you a sense of the scale of it. And uh, rather than representing people uh, in conflict, they use insects. Uh, and so there, that's why you have this giant beetle thing here. So their work is intricately thought out, carefully researched, and beautifully executed. Uh, so they really focus on that intersection of aesthetics and politics. The Cost of Coal is another piece by the Beehive Collective. I'm sure they talked about that one when they came here. And again, this is a detail, which is actually a little bit easier to read, um, where you can see this greedy frog, poor frog, uh, pumping oil. And these people are all uh, sort of sucking it up. And then you have the tromping of people's homes, et cetera. Now, I just want to mention in terms of coal, this is just for you guys. Um, are you aware of, of all that's going on with coal right here in Washington State? I need you to get involved. Um, the, uh, there's this massive plan. Anybody aware of this? Anybody here? Nobody? Massive plan uh, to take uh, coal. From, you see this um, Wyoming, this area over here, uh, to take the coal from there uh, and uh, ship it on massive trains all the way all over to um, the Pacific Ocean. And we're talking like 100 car trains with coal dust flying off of it, really, really polluting. And there's been a massive fight this year in Bellingham and Longview, they refused it. Now they've got their eyes on Aberdeen, Hoquiam, and Grace Harbor, which just happens to be a wildlife refuge and a bird sanctuary. So you guys, you can get on that. Um, we need artists to protest. It's not even that publicized. I went down there to watch birds, and this guy, you know, he's, he was an activist, but he was all alone, and he said, well, they're trying to sneak it by us. It's under the water. So anyway, that's uh, about coal in Washington State. Need some artists on the job. Go for it. Another interesting collaboration between artists and um, certain kinds of environmental issue is this group, um, Particles and Half-Lives. The scientists are phys physicians for social responsibility, and they have taken the initiative to reach out to poets and writers and artists and create exhibitions which address the Hanford plant and the fallout at the plant. So they have this show at the library at the University of Washington, and they are opening a show in Lacey on uh, June 4th in the Department of Ecology. I'm just going to show you one artwork from the show. It was a big show. Um, Douglas Glass, he's from uh, Tacoma, no, uh, Tri-Cities, which of course is where the fallout is going on. And uh, it, it, it says here, uh, 157 are confirmed leakers. 
which means that the glass tanks that they're storing the nuclear waste in, 157 of them have already been confirmed as leakers. And then he created this, uh, this image of the contrast of the leakers and the total number of containers. I thought it was a very beautifully executed piece. Another artist, she's from here, from Evergreen, she teaches here, who has addressed the nuclear uh, spill issue, and she's going to be included in Particles on the Wall when it's shown in Ellensburg next fall, um, although she doesn't know it yet because I organized it. I forgot to tell her. <laughs> um, she, I think she'll be all right. But, um, this is a piece where she's created these organs out of felt, which are actually cancer-contaminated organs of various parts of the body. And then inside of one of them, she placed a video, which is a series of Native Americans talking about the effect of nuclear dumping on reservations. And of course, Hanford is bordered by, nuclear, by uh, Indian reservations. So it has uh, uh, several people from, uh, from that area, as well as the Grand Canyon and uh, all of all different areas of, of the Southwest. So it's a, it's a multimedia piece. Also very close to you, uh, how many of you have heard of the Confluence Project? Anybody? One hand, okay. Two hands, good, okay. Um, I'm not gonna talk about the whole thing, I'm just gonna be very brief, but it's something that I thought was an important subject for you because it's right here in our area. Maya Lin, of course, designed the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. when she was 21 years old. Um, she has had a lifelong interest in ecology and addressing the uh, terrible uh, abuses of the land. And she has a fabulous website right now, which you can look at. The sites, there are seven sites. You saw the map, seven sites. I'm not going to go into all the sites. I'm only going to talk about this site, which hasn't yet been completed. But it is actually the heart of the Confluence Project because the confluence was the idea of bringing together different cultures, different, um, different points of view about the river, and it was initially started during the commemoration of the Lewis and Clark expedition and the idea of expanding it into something a little more um, varied than just hooray, hooray. And uh, Maya Lin, of course, wasn't a particle interested in Lewis and Clark, but the native leaders from the Columbia River uh, area saw her movie, saw the movie about her Vietnam Memorial, and they said, this is the woman that we want to do the Confluence Project to commemorate our loss as a result of Lewis and Clark. So they went to Soho, and they talked to her, and they talked about the loss not only in terms of the, uh, the devastation to the, uh, to the tribes, but the ecological loss as well. And so she agreed to create this massive project. Now, the reason I say this is the heart of the project is because the, one of the most recent and enormous losses was when they did the John, Dale, John Day Dam uh, near the Dalles, and they wiped out these historic waterfalls, which were the sort of cultural heart of the Northwest. Uh, the, in, the native groups came from all over the Northwest to gather here and, and, and catch fish and socialize. And it was a really, really profound, horrifying event when the dam was built and wiped everything out. So they want to have a particular commemoration of that loss. This was not Lewis and Clark. This was later, of course, but it's all part of the same fabric. Um, and so this was the dedication of the... Um, of, of the uh, site at Celilo Falls. Uh, that's my Lynn there. These are some of the elders that came to DC, uh, although there are many, many other groups involved. And, and her proposal is to create a cantilevered um, a ramp that echoes the idea of the cantilevered, I guess I don't have a cantilevered uh, uh, platform there, but they, ha they fished off of cantilevered platform. And then the yes men. A very different approach, very funny, very smart, and intersecting with corporate culture um, as a, a comment on the environment. So this is one, I, I have this on the back of the book, on the picture, on the back cover. The Survivor Ball, it has a website, look it up. They do s simulations of corporate culture and really make fun of it. So on the website, this is a collaboration, and you can just see the logos here of 50 different corporations who are saying, don't worry about climate change, we've got the perfect answer. We're gonna sell you this ball that you can be, get everything you need while you're inside of it. 
So they are uh, extraordinarily uh, effective at, this was an event in Seattle when uh, we had the survive, there's that same picture, and the performance uh, of climate stabilization, ecological well-being uh, in the downtown Seattle. Incidentally, that man there on the drums up there on the right is the founder of Backbone Campaign, Bill Moyer. He's a, his roots are as a drummer. So. Okay, uh, other topics in my book, artists address police states. And again, I want to give one background work, a very important artist who died in 2004, Leon Golub, who went against the mainstream art world uh, in representing, and this is based on Central American um, interrogation procedures trained by the, in the School of Americas, these uh, horrifying um, torture procedures, which now we recognize as something we've seen since. But at the time that he did, these are very large paintings. The figures aren't life-size, but they really tower over you in, in, in the gallery. When he did these paintings, everyone was doing a really you know, nice sort of narcissistic, big giant paintings and things of not particular political content. And uh, he was really, really a pioneer, so I want to honor him. An artist from uh, Seattle who I also think is an extraordinary artist, uh, lived her whole life committed to politically engaging art. And this is what she called her Black Book of Aggressors. It was the last piece that she was working on uh, when she died in 2008. Each page is just a small notebook sized image done with chalk. And so these are two close ups of two of the works. Um, and she was able to actually from newspaper articles, she didn't even own a computer, to get the factual details about how torture was perpetrated. This is Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib, uh, and, and depict it. So in this case, um, using cables, and the electricity of the, of the event is one of the things that she captures, that adrenaline rush that goes with this kind of activity. And she made a relationship between that and the adrenaline rush of sex which made it very hard for her to get her work shown because she has a lot of um, exposed uh, uh, penises in her work. So that, that was difficult. But her work here, the waterboarding, she did five of these, strapped to the board upside down. You can see, here's his head. Immersed in a wet towel to fake drowning, used to impose anguish without leaving marks. Now, just the fact of writing that is painful. For me, it's painful to read it to look at it, to see it, and to imagine her able to stay with this subject and, and represent it. And she did hundreds of these drawings. Let me just go back. That's the whole part of the whole series. I just wanted to give you a shot of her studio uh, to give you a sense of how she worked. This was the last series that she never made. This is a Goya again, Goya devouring his son. And she imagined a series Goya as the god of war consuming its victims around the planet. And this was in her notes, all the different places where she was going to represent that. And this was her last page that she never created. Uh, and all the way she worked, all the notes that she took and the images. So she brought all of these different sources together. She also was a public activist and involved with women in black. So if you look at that central image up there that the woman is holding with the red square, it looks a little bit like the Black Anna that I showed you at the beginning by Katie Kolvitz. It's actually Selma's drawing based on Black Anna, but it makes that connection for you. So another artist who addressed torture uh, is Daniel Heyman. He was invited to join a legal team that went to uh, Turkey to interview uh, recently released um, uh, prisoners from uh, Abu Ghraib to talk about their experiences for a class action suit against the contractor. You can't sue the US government for torture, but you can sue contractors. So he, as an artist, was invited to join them. And he sat in on these very painful interviews where he had a, um, an etching plate uh, with him. And he wrote backwards on the etching plate, because when you make a print, it, it's reversed. He was able to do backward writing on the etching plate. And he wrote down what they said, and he also did these incredible drawings of the person as he was speaking. And this, this work is illustrated in my book. 
And he wrote it down word for word as best he could. Uh, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he, this is called Disco Mosul. And it's a room where the soldiers uh, would put men naked with bags on their heads and make them dance for 12 hours. That's just the beginning of what it says. And you can see that he's also lost his arm and one of his legs. So Daniel Heyman's series, uh, which was shown in Oregon last year, uh, is, is a very powerful group of works. Uh, another artist who addresses an issue from this region, Roger Shimamura, this is the cover of my book. Uh, he uh, was, in, he was uh, in the Japanese uh, camps in the US during World War II as a three-year-old with his grandmother and his, the rest of his family. And for the people that were um, rounded up during World War II, the, the uh, experience is so searing. It's still with them all their lives. And as the Iraq war was escalating and roundup of people was escalating in the US, he made this painting, American Infamy, which uh, notice that we're up there in the, in the tower with the surveillance. And it shows the uh, Japanese camp uh, during World War II where uh, the Japanese were forced to live in the middle of, uh, of, of the desert of various places. But it talks about it can happen again. And this is a huge painting. These are four big, big, big panels. Uh, really powerful uh, image. Roger Shimamura draws on a completely set, different set of stylistic references. Selma Waldman comes right out of the German expressionist style with the, a very active line, whereas Shimamura is looking at pop art. And he also looks at uh, Japanese art uh, and Chinese art and also uh, various other references, including modernism. So it's a, it's a completely different set of stylistic sources. Here's an example of pop. Artists resist police states. Pop. So there's Roger. That's his self-portrait. John Quick to see Smith uh, is also discussed in my book. Uh, Actually, she's in the ecological chapter because she is also very involved with that subject. But I think this fits very well with the artist resist police state section. Uh, this is an incredible print that she did uh, called Fear 2005 in the midst of the Iraq War. Uh, and in her, her frame of reference is also uh, Native American, references to Native American imagery in various ways, as well as expressionism. And, and also, she is familiar with. Uh, Ma mainstream um, abstract expressionism. But again, it's a highly original image. Uh, now, artists resist police states. Uh, the, the killing of John T. Williams, any of you heard of that? One, two, three, three, four, OK. Uh, by a policeman. He was a, wood, a native wood carver. Uh, from uh, Seattle, but ba his tribe was based in Alaska, uh, created an immense uh, uproar. Uh, and the Native community came to City Hall to protest at the time of the killing. This is the protest. His brother then created a totem project. That's his brother. You can't see him very well in the background in commemoration of John T. Williams, because of course totem poles are historically commemor commemorative poles. And this is the dedication um, on the waterfront in Seattle of this immense totem pole in honor of John T. Williams. And then I just had to show you this moving of the totem pole. I just thought this was a tremendous example of, of community collaboration in resisting oppression. Moving the, this massively heavy totem pole through the city of Seattle to Seattle Center and raising it up with uh, pulleys and levers in the same way that uh, heavy equipment has been, heavy things have been moved for, for millennia, completely non-mechanical, and then the pole itself. And the, if you go to Seattle Center, look for it. It's over near uh, the EMP. The brother said, it's a statement of healing and peace in the community. So this is a very beautiful example of resistance to police states and a positive affirmation of another way of thinking. OK. Um, women war and imperialism. The, here's one example from Goya's Disasters of War, which I mentioned at the beginning. This, of course, is an image of rape, an image of abuse of women. And very rarely does this get 
represented by anybody. We, we're starting to hear more about it uh, in terms of the uh, U.S. military and the women in the military, but how many artists have represented it? Very few. Sukkot is an artist who, in this, this is actually addressing Haiti, but here you see this idea of the impact of, 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 the war, of war and, and disadvantage, in this case, of course, the earthquake and the, these huge colonial hands reaching down but not quite making any connection uh, with the woman. Uh, Deborah Lawrence works in collage, uh, and she does the, and on uh, metal, small metal TV trays, these are quite small, it's about this big, uh, and she addresses the position of women within all of these, uh, the military and the, uh, and the religious and the capitalist, and uh, she writes, she cuts out the words to write on it a statement of resistance uh, by protect us from the unsolicited male gaze, but also deliver us from universal institutionalized misogyny and keep us safe from rape, bondage, slavery, domination, genocide, racism, sexism, hunger, war, and greed. Let's see, we're running, I want to, I want to be sure to get to the Middle East. Coco Fusco addresses the issue of women in the military in performance pieces, and this is the artist herself dressed up as a military sergeant. Uh, she's done a series of works where she demonstrates how feminism, uh, the sort of power of women, has been completely perverted in the process of torturing men in the Middle East by using women's bodies to address, uh, to, to try to torture men, uh, 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 Muslim men. Uh, Martha Rossler, uh, who's been working for decades, is addressing the contradiction between women in the domestic sphere and war. And in, during the Vietnam War, she started these photo collages uh, where you can see this woman is vacuuming her apron and then the war is going on outside. Um, the more recent series is in color and it's got current technology, but it's the same idea women with their little gadgets looking at the war on the cell phone while the death and destruction is surrounding them. So uh, I wanted particularly to get to this section because last two weeks ago uh, I was able to visit Maquiladora factories, maybe I went by that too fast, in the free trade zone between border Mexico and U.S. Of course now Mexico is entirely a free trade zone but initially these were built uh, in the uh, 10 mile radius inside the border. Whoops, sorry, went the wrong way. So I, I was very excited to actually see what maquiladoras look like and uh, these are, these are uh, factories where a lot of high tech equipment is made, uh, particularly medical equipment, and uh, they have uh, pe workers come from all over Mexico to work there, they leave their communities, uh, and there's, there's no, no, well, the union is a, there's people trying to organize for better working conditions, for health care. It's very, very difficult. Um, so this is, an, this is an old factory, kind of a nice brick building on the street. This is a new factory with a huge metal fence and a guard that was calling his boss as soon as we stopped. Um, I was down there with Fred uh, Lanadier, who's one of the artists in my book, very important artist, addressing work and health and safety issues. Uh, this was a piece that he did actually quite a while ago, but it's being shown all over the place right now. That quote is from one of the workers talking about the fact that his lung is, is that he's going to die. It's money in their pockets. They don't have to pay the people. They kill them, but they don't have to pay for it. That's exactly what I think. So this uh, artist has been making an interconnection between labor issues and health and safety and workers' issues and art. Another strategy that he did was to take a whole um, a truck down and park it outside the factory. This is the truck, that's the truck, this is the inside of the truck. And he has his work, which is involved with photo collage and text, displayed inside the truck. It's, he works very aesthetically. Uh, in terms of the arrangement, but very understandably in terms of the content, to educate workers in these factories about their rights and options for making their conditions better. 
So he's a, a real on the ground activist as well as an artist. Um, Celia Munoz's mother worked in a garment factory uh, many years ago, and she's addressing specifically the abuses of garment working on the border with this lush, lush, lush uh, fabric hanging in the gallery and these exotic clothing suggesting the seduction of capitalism, but yet many of the young women who work in these factories are murdered. They, they're murdered and their murders are never solved. They're very vulnerable. They, they have no social structure um, where, they're, where they're living. Uh, and uh, so she created this installation because often the only thing that's found is their shoes. And then I, I, when I was in uh, San Diego uh, a couple of weeks ago, I saw this work. Unfortunately, I don't have an artist's name on it, but just I thought it was a very beautiful work commemorating the women who, uh, men and women who have died crossing the border. A very simple, t I think these are corn husks um, that they've used, but I'm not positive. And finally, my last section um, on the Middle East, uh, you all know about Rachel Corey here, don't you? Everybody? Yes. yes. Okay, I got to get a good yes on that one. Um, so I'll get, I'll get to why I said that in a minute. Uh, the, this project, which you see here, which was a painting on the wall, which I discuss in the book, for a particular family, and it's a particular story, the separation wall between Israel and Palestine, which the Israelis have put up. Um, was created by a group uh, called Break the Silence Mural Project. And these are details of that same stretch of wall. And uh, the Amher family is, this is uh, the mother here on the lower right, um, has, has the wall right outside their house. Uh, and so they brought a lot of people to come and, and paint a mural on the wall. And there's been a movie made about it and everything. They refused to leave, so they made the wall really close to their house and cut them off completely from their livelihood, their orchards. Uh, they were a well-off middle-class family with lots of different um, options for making a living, and then they slammed this wall right, right in front of them. But what I want to mention, of course, is the wall is the Break the Silence project here in collaboration with the Rachel Corey Foundation. Have you seen this tree? All right, so I haven't been there for a while. Now, what I understand is that it has this wonderful interactive technology, right? And it works. I, I'm going to go down there after, after I finish here. So you just take your cell phone and call up and hear. Can you explain? Oh, yeah, I'm sure there are. I took this a few years ago. And uh, it's a fabulous idea because you have the leaves themselves are, are made by groups from all over the world or individuals. I think uh, Gail Tremblay has a leaf on the tree and maybe some other people from Evergreen. And then you have this way of extending the story. So it's not just standing there looking at this fabulous tree, but you have this sense of e amplification. Have you listened to the, is it like talking about the particular information? That's always a pitfall with technology, isn't it? Doesn't work. Yeah. But anyway, of course, the Rachel Cora Foundation is, is extraordinarily important in um, forging alliances with artist groups and forging alliances with political powers to keep the issue of Palestine um, to the fore. But another artist who addresses uh, Palestine, this is a Palestinian artist from Bethlehem. She uses video. And she creates short videos that are based on the kind of genres of, of, of popular TV, like a cooking show. This is obviously sci-fi. Um, she has a horror, a horror show, which would be an easy fit for a Palestinian. Um, let's see, uh, Wild West show, one of my favorites, uh, Bethlehem Bandolero. Uh, and this one is, it starts out with the music from 2001, A Space Odyssey. I'm not going to sing it, but you all know it. And uh, She's in the cockpit of the spaceship, you know, and she takes off and she goes to the moon and she puts on the Palestinian flag there. And then at the end, she floats off into outer space because she can't go home. And that's the message. So I recommend her. She has a great website. 
And I'm going to conclude with these two artists who are Iraqi artists in London that I'm, I have met and talked to. And this Hana Mal Allah was a prominent art professor at the University uh, of Baghdad, a major, major art school in, in Baghdad. This is a subject you don't hear anything about. There was a huge contemporary art museum in Baghdad, and almost every one of the works disappeared out of it, 7,000 works. I have a friend who's working on trying to locate these works, and she's found so far 2,000. And Hana's works all disappeared out of the museum. Working in London now, she is, uh, she is, these are burned and ripped pieces of canvas, which she is attaching to the surface of, of the piece. So it's, it's almost an abstract piece, but it has this really powerful uh, content of her history and her life. There, I have a lot more by here, but we don't have time for that. So the last piece, Dia al -Azawi. He's a different generation. He's an older artist. He's been in London longer also deeply addressing Iraq here. This is a Trojan horse. And each of these flowers represents uh, one of the academic uh, professors who has been assassinated in Iraq. I don't know if you're familiar with the fact that a lot of the middle class professionals, not just academics, but doctors and other people, have been assassinated. So he's made this really phenomenal monument to that event. And uh, this, this was. Uh, completed a couple of years ago. So I'll go back to that comment I made at the beginning. The most disputed border of all is one that separates the field of cultural production and the field of power. And all of the artists in my book are making that breach, are making that connection, are making that relationship. And it is disputed. We, they want artists to stay. Plato put them all in the cave. They want them to stay in their little s s space and not connect to these powerful issues. But all of the artists that I've talked about collectively and individually have done that. So thank you. So let's see, how do I turn these on? OK. Great. Snazzy podium. I love it. So if you have any questions, yes. Yes. Okay. Bourdieu, yeah. yeah. The Field of Cultural Production, exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's a fabulous book. He's brilliant. Sociologist. Yeah. Any other questions? Questions? Well, I could ask you some questions. <laughs> The last one? You mean the Iraqi one? Oh, you mean the quote? Yes. Why was that one, the art professor, why was her art stolen? Like, what was the reason behind this, the theft? I'm sorry, which art professor? The, she was, I don't remember the, the contemporary. Museum, art museum, museum. Yeah, the, yeah the, the artist, the, the professor that's looking for the artwork? Why were the pe why was the museum robbed? Well, the m the contemporary artwork was a collection from all over the Middle East, and interestingly enough, Saddam Hussein definitely sponsored the buying of this contemporary art collection. So part of it would have been attacking, you know, what Saddam Hussein had done <laughs> in Baghdad. And you know how much culture was destroyed in Baghdad. The libraries, the scientific. Um, institutions, the archaeological institutions, and I think the impulse of, of, of robbing those was partially the same impulse. Um, also, the work is valuable, but not, not widely regarded. It's not like, you know, something from Ur or something from the Mesopotamian culture where everybody knows about it, and even that is leaving the country in the thousands. But people in the know know that that work is, is, is valuable also. It, there were major, major artists from Middle Eastern contemporary art from the last 50 years. So it would have been that, too. Good question. Other questions? So this is, yeah, go ahead. So for artists, too, um, I mean, you have this, you, you obviously, you really want people to, to jump into the art. So <laughs> So it's like how, so 
where, how do you recommend that, that artists who don't feel like they have the, the political knowledge to, to just jump into it? Like, where do you recommend they start? Or what oh, well, I think you have to start from what you care about. You know, what, what is it that you want to say? If, if, if you want to make political art, you probably have something that you really care about. It doesn't matter whether you know all about it. I mean, like I was researching the Hanford nuclear spill thing because I didn't know very much in order to just reference it. And I was like, and today with the internet, you can find out about anything immensely. That's sort of the issue, it's like there's so much. Well, I, I, mean, I mean, I would ask you, if you're asking for yourself, what, what, really, what do you really feel bad about? What do you really want to make a difference about? I mean, is there something that you feel like would be an important, because if you don't know what it is that you want to say, it is difficult to start. But I could say this, um, I, I care about too many things, as you can tell. Um, it's a problem. Uh, but I went, I've been going to these meetings in Seattle with the people that were artists affiliated with Occupy, um, very motivated people, and they're doing targeted um, events up there, you know. and. I don't know anything about foreclosing, thank goodness, I'm lucky. My house hasn't been foreclosed. But I'm willing to make a sign and get involved as an art writer and an art critic. Uh, I don't have to know everything if I'm with a group. So one option is to be with a group of people that do know. Another option is if you care about something, or start thinking about what is it that bothers me, you know? Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question because I used to be so legitimate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I do have to say my, my book, and, and there's, there's also another, there's another part of it, yeah. I, I, do, I do get a lot of sort of, oh, that's Susan, you know. <laughs> but that's all right. Um, there's sort of the in political people that are based in New York and they're funded by Creative Time and that book I mentioned at the beginning, Living is Form by Nato Thompson, you might want to write it down, it's a provocative book. Masses of funding, every page in color. Um, and he says, you know, living is form, everything is art. But he really focuses on his favorite people and he does it. So there's a sort of an in political t approach which I haven't figured out, because I just do what I care about and the artists that I respect. And, and um, a lot of the artists in my book, my publisher kept saying, can't you do some people we've all heard of? You know, because they're not that well known. So I, I, I did, I added in more people that are famous. But yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of difficulty. And like getting my book reviewed, you know. It's an interesting issue though. Why is some political art, like Alan Sekula, Leon Golub, why are some people able to break through that wall of resistance, but most people aren't. It's a good question, yeah. But it's okay, I'm happy, yeah. Um, when is art not political, or what defines uh, political art? What defines political art, or when is art not political? Ha. Hmm. Ah. What do you think? Well, what I used to think, I can tell you what I used to think, and then I'll tell you where I am now. Uh, I used to say that, well, all art is political on the sense that if you choose to paint abstractly, it's still a political statement that you're not, that you've chosen to create this abstract work of art that isn't addressing a specific issue. So that's one position, that whatever you do, it's a political act uh, if you're an artist. My own position is that political art combines a, a, an astute understanding of aesthetics and media and technique with a deep concern for an issue. And all the artists that I include in my book are lifelong committed to the issue and usually personally involved with it. Uh, but now I have this whole new thing going on with Occupy, which is changing the way I think. And I'm beginning to think that I, I'm too limited in, in defining it with aesthetics and materials, and, and I can open it up, you know, and, and, and the creative expression of, of, of all of those people trying to make a new society with Occupy and self, you know, barter, a barter economy and everybody contributing things and giving things and, you know, they had medical and they had food and they had, it's a whole new creative idea. So I'm, I'm sort of in transition and expanding my idea of political art 
to include that there aren't any boundaries, uh, actually. But I'm still a little reluctant to say that. I'm still feeling like there needs to be some kind of aesthetic framing. So I'm not quite ready to say everything is art or everything is politics. So that's where I am right now. Did you want to express an opinion on that? As an art professor? Yeah, he's in my book, right? Right. I think that their work leaves, leaves a specific issue and transcends into something bigger. And a lot of the artists that you've shown are, are well known, right, for that. Mm -hmm. One of the definitions of art. Could you all hear that back in the back? Is that it's not instrumental, or one of the criticisms of art, or one of, the, one of its facets, right? That it, that it exists in this. It has no purpose? Right, that it's not instrumentalized. When you say instrumentalized, what do you mean? Meaning that it's used for something, a purpose, like either propaganda or um, decoration. Do you think there is any art that cannot, that is, has no purpose? Because, I mean, even if you're making a, a painting of a landscape and hanging in a museum, there is a purpose. Right. So this is magic. I'm, yeah. I'm not saying, I'm just, these are the arguments that I can think of. Right. It's a very, very important point. To what extent does an artist want to be engaged in an issue so that the issue takes over from the art, I think is what you mean by instrumentalized, right? Whereas the, the artists in my book that I have favored are artists who create that heightening of awareness without the work, the, the content being the main thing, it's balanced between the aesthetics and, and the content. And yet you, I mean like the beautiful installation with all the fabric and then the, and then the shoe installation in the middle of the women who had died, you're aware of the, of the, uh, of the uh, subject, but you're also aware of the artist's presence. So I, I'm sort of on that page too, but I'm beginning to feel like I'm old fashioned, <laughs> that I need to expand, but we'll see. Yeah. Other questions? Those are great questions. Anybody in the back row wearing a red hat, orange hat, do you have a question? You're so far away. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting uh, point. Uh, and what I think is that cumulatively, if everybody was doing something like that, no matter how hidden or whatever, it, it, it's really important. It's really important, yeah. It doesn't always have to be in a march or even in a gallery. But I was like going all over for this uh, idea of the living as form, and then I went to the Tacoma Art Gallery last weekend. I said, there is a absolute place for the intensity of the experience of going into an art museum and seeing art in that context. It is, you know, you're not distracted by anything else and the art just sings to you whatever it has to say. And uh, I just felt like I, I'm going to stay with this uh, experience, Tacoma Art Museum. Other questions? Yeah.
Are you well, let's have an example. Let's say, take Roger Shimamura's work, the one on the cover of the book, OK? Um, awareness is a purpose. What do you mean by taking it out of its context? Well, I mean, for instance, like with the, the piece you showed in San Diego with the corner. Mm -hmm. You mean if it was shown to people that had no idea what those names meant, and, and they were just looking at the corn husks and the names, and they didn't know what it was all about? Is that what you mean by removoving the purpose? That it yeah, would be shown to people that don't any have indication that it was about any indication it was about anything. You just have corn husks and names. Um, well, certainly it would have less meaning. Absolutely. Uh, it doesn't it tell you what. In other words, will it stand on its own as pure aesthetics without knowing a thing about it? Is, is that sort of where you're going? Or, I mean, yeah, aesthetics or any other purpose. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, that particular piece, which was a collective piece done fa fairly, I think, informally, um, I thought it was quite beautiful. Whether it would stand on its own at the Museum of Modern Art, I don't know. I mean, that would be the kind of thing you're talking about. Take that piece and put it in the Museum of Modern Art. Um, it might look, uh, it might not be so strong, but definitely seeing it in San Diego, right next to the border, yeah. So, I, yeah, I think context is very important in the, in the understanding of a work. I guess I have to say, yes, it does need context. But some works, as Osha was saying, don't, oh, that's your last name, Shaw, sorry. I love your last name, that's the trouble. Um, <laughs> as Shaw was saying, uh, s rise beyond their context and speak to people no matter what, like Alfredo Jar, whom I didn't show but is in the book. He works with light and dark in this amazing way so that you have the information and then it's gone. And it's very specific to issues, but at the same time, it, it makes you think in a very sort of big way uh, about the issue in a bigger way. And that's very hard to do, but it does succeed really well with an international audience. Now, some people would say that if you get too universal, then uh, it doesn't have that much meaning. It's, it's diluted. It's packaged for the masses, and people don't, you know, there's arguments for that, too. So I don't know if that was a satisfactory answer, but it was a great question. <laughs> did you all, did you have a question? Do I make any art? Well, I consider my art to. <laughs> no, no, no. It's fine. I, I am, I am mainly my creative expression is mainly through writing, and uh, I'm just now in transition with my writing. I'm trying to figure out if blog, blog writing can be creative. Uh, visual, visual art. I'll go with the group. You know, if I'm told to do something, I'll, I'll go collective. I'll, I'll do it with other people. But I've recently become aware that the signs that people hold at demonstrations are like a people's poetry. Some of them are extraordinarily interesting and, and creative. I've, I've never done that kind of artwork, uh, people's poetry signs. My signs tend to be fairly straightforward. But uh, yeah, in terms of creativity, I, I think words are my medium. Yeah. So how are we doing here? We got a few more minutes. Any other questions? Good questions. I knew Evergreen would come through with good questions. You guys are so good. Yeah. You're obviously passionate about the topics. I was curious <coughs> where your passion came from, what life experiences shaped you to uh, stand for the position. Question. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, that's a question and a half. Um, I could be very blunt and tell you the truth, or I could be evasive and um, polite. <laughs> I don't know which I want to do. Um, I guess I'll be, I'll tell you the truth, but I'll try not to be too blunt. Uh, I had, I was a tenured professor in Texas at the University of North Texas, and I, I became aware of the machinations of academic politics, which I thought were absolutely horrendous. And because it was Texas, you know, there's no unions for teachers, there's no recourse, and I was told you can't, you can't do anything about it. So I quit. <laughs> Um, yeah, I walked out on my tenure job because I couldn't stand it. 
So that, instead of bothering with Texas, that's what radicalized me. Because then I took all of that anger and I, and I began to really get involved with political issues uh, in the street. And uh, that's what, what, that was the anger that drove me uh, out of the academic hotbed and into the real world of politics. So that was the driving force. And it's still, I mean, I've forgotten all about that, really. But uh, it, it, it was what I decided to do. Yeah. Back in the back, orange hat. Ah. Sometimes put lives in danger. How do you feel about that? I think it's terrible. I don't think that people should ever put other people's lives in danger, uh, especially just to get attention. And uh, I don't think it's necessary for any cause to do that. Uh, I think it's counterproductive to do that. Uh, do you have a specific example? Oh, their own lives in danger. I thought you meant other people's lives in danger. Well, you could also do other lives. Um, like There's a big difference between risking your own life and putting other people's lives in danger, right? I, I mean, I have no problem if some artist wants to risk their own life. In fact, you know there was an artist, a very, very prominent media artist, who was, who was killed in Tahrir Square in Egypt. Uh, and he, uh, he was a leading media artist in, in, in Egypt. And, the, in the Venice Biennale, this huge international exhibition, they devoted the entire Egyptian pavilion to his, to his work. Uh, he put his life in danger. Uh, but putting other people's, I thought you meant like, both well, in both, in both terms. and someone like Damien Hirst, who I absolutely detest, uh, he, put, he uses animals and butterflies, and he puts natural life in danger, or even sacrifices it for his art. That, I think, is detestable. Serial killers? Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> uh, how is that related to art? Because, like, you know, they take, like, the bodies of the people that they kill and put them in, like, either positions or arrangements. Oh, that's, that's ghastly, isn't it? Come on, everybody. Yeah, that's horrible. That's nothing to do with anything except really sick person, right? Needs a little mental it how health. An apple? An animal. Animal. Oh, are, are, are you going toward um, vegan? The idea that if we're eating the food we're well, responsible for? Ah, I, I see where you're coming from now. Yeah. I think, I think most people here would agree that that's not art. What about it, everybody? What? I would say it's art, I just wouldn't say I didn't like it. You would say it was art to choke a puppy? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to argue about what is art. Yeah. <laughs> She's really a provocateur back there, right? That's incredible stuff you're throwing out. Mm. <laughs> no, it's OK. I mean, it's good for us all to think about what we think. Where, where we draw the line, and you saw what I thought, and he has another opinion, maybe other, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, it's kind of on a different track. Good. <laughs> well, I was just thinking about the other clip that you had at the beginning that I was talking about. Chant with illusion. The realism between just reproducing an image and making. Yeah, and like creating or expressing this experience through like an artistic rendering. Right. Uh, talking about offering your services or what maybe like what's the differences and how that makes it political or mercantile or enchanted or. Right, that's an interesting point. So immediately, who pops to mind when you talk about newspapers is Andy Warhol, of course, who, who took 
you know, race riot right out of the paper, black and white, silk screen, the image. There it was, it hit us like it was a really strong uh, image. And he didn't do anything to it except silk screen it in black and white. Uh, the Katie Kovitz image, yeah. Now in that case, uh, Selma Waldman is, works in a very expressionist style, which is similar to Katie Kovitz's style, which ne neither of them are realistic in the traditional sense of you know reproducing everything. But Joshua Boulay, the artist that I had from Zuccotti uh, Park, that was doing those fabulous drawings of Zuccotti Park while the Occupy was going on there, very realistic, very detailed. Um, uh, not a photograph, but very, very uh, well done. Um, are, you, are, are you asking, you know, what point does it become art or not art in the realism? That's, that's, hard. that's hard. Very hard. Yeah, it depends on the artist. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And so then there's like this intersection between like reality and fantasy that's like still occurring. Yeah. I don't know. I guess that's just No, it's an interesting it, fantasy is an interesting point. And um, I think the key thing in that quote is soothe and enchant with fantasy. In other words, she's seeing it as an escape. But I just saw this phenomenal performance in Seattle on Saturday night, and it was, it was absolutely enchanting, but it was extremely political at the same time. It was uh, based on poetry by uh, Kafavi, who's a Greek poet in Alexandria, who was a closeted homosexual for his whole life. And so the pieces were about this tension between his life uh, as a bureaucrat and his desire to break three, free and express his sexuality. And it was, it was absolutely full of fantasy but it didn't soothe me. So I think it's this soothing, it did enchant me, but I didn't, I didn't feel soothed. I felt absolutely gripped by, by what was being represented. It was very political, but absolutely beautiful. So yeah, I think you can use fantasy. Um, I think it's not something I would rule out. So that quote may be a little flawed. Now maybe I won't use it anymore. But anyway, thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> We're out of time. Okay, thank you.